I, a fantastic guest. Uh, just uh, somebody that I, I, I think uh, you would call iconic, uh, legendary. Uh, there are a million uh, words to say, but uh, I normally I, I'm like, hey, I'm John Cato and we go into this. But I got to say right out of the gates today, folks, we have uh, Jerry Mathers, the beef yeah. with us. And we are stoked. Very stoked. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, it, it is our pleasure. And of course, uh, with me co-hosting today is Bob Bergen. As and I, I always want to know that I, I have my official Jerry Mathers signed uh, Still the Beaver baseball cap. That it I looks I, marvelous I, on you. I, it, listen, heck, it's Jerry. You got, a, you got a bigger head than I do. And, and, and we, John and I were just talking about our, our haircuts. And I'm looking at this. I, it looks more like Charlie Brown than it does uh, uh, Beaver Cleaver. But um, yeah, I got to say, buddy, um, now I will say that I got this at an auction. It was a, like a, a theater auction. I got this. I got, a, I got signed uh, shoe by Tom Hanks, and I got a signed uh, Ordinary People script by Mary Tyler Moore. But this was my favorite. And so when I showed it to Jerry, because uh, Jerry served on uh, the PGEC with me uh, yeah. at the TV and John, by the way, got me into the TV academy. We'll talk about that. Later. <laughs> That's but a whole I said, other thing. I said to Jerry, "Is this real? It's green." And Jerry was like, "It was green." And now, Actually, it's yeah, it's very funny because my mom, the very first day we went to shoot the pilot for Leave It to Beaver, it was kind of drizzling, and so my mom knew that we were going outside for one or two shots, and so she just grabbed something that she had in the closet. My dad was a coach, so he had a lot of like baseballs and all sorts of things. And this green hat happened to be there. Come well, on. when the producers saw it, they thought that looks great. But you know how wardrobe people are. When you do a series, you have three or four of everything, like every shirt I had, every oh, pants. Yeah. They could never find a green hat like that for the entire six years. And so that guy would watch me like a hawk. It was my hat. Lunchtime would come. I'd be running out to go to lunch and they'd grab the hat off me. As soon as the guy said cut any time that I was out of school so I wouldn't go outside and play football or baseball with it on, it'd grab it off me. So it was a lot of fun. So you're saying for six years on that show, you wore the exact hat? That same hat. You know, everything else like T-shirts, pants, any kind of wardrobe, I had four or five of. Right. I spilled something on it or they could send it out that night and still have a clean thing the next day. But the hat, they could never find another one that was even close to it. Okay, you where have is it? it? Where's, where's the hat? I still have it. My wife, Teresa, keeps it under lock and key. She doesn't even let me know because I'd probably walk off with it and leave it someplace. Oh my God, that's what it, that is so, so, it's it, because you know, it's, there's certain things in TV shows that are also characters that, 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 you know, it's like a sense of memory. It's like Gilligan's hat. It's like the Afghan on the back of the couch on, on Roseanne, but Beaver's cap, because in the opening credits one year, I think they showed you putting the cap on to go outside or something, because your credits changed every year, didn't they? Right, they wanted to make that so people would know that it was a different year. But yeah, every year, we do 39 a year for six years. Right. So almost, wow one episode a day for just, I think it's like 234 episodes altogether. They can show one a day before they have to start re-showing them. Wow. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And, that and the residuals that are paying you, you must be like in, in, in Malibu overlooking the ocean with, this, with the servants. I mean, because let's talk about residuals on TV. Yeah, you were well, one of the first I read that got that signed a contract that actually gave you merchandising or something like that. Is that true? That's what I did get. It, for the first six times it was shown. Right. That's what SAG After did. Um, that's my union. So that, that was a union rule. Before that, though, I did other things that were not like Leave it to Beaver, not a series, but other things where you didn't get residuals except maybe one or two. So I did get it for the first six times. It was a, a, a very good sum of money. And I was able to put myself through college with that money. So it was something that set me on my. Uh, on the right track when I was growing up. And it was a lot of fun to do. To be honest with you, I'd have probably done it for free just for the fun. Yeah. What was the mer what, what merchandise? Yeah. We did hats, we did all sorts of things. We did Leave It to Beaver lunch boxes, base sign baseballs, all sorts of things like that. And I still do. You go to my website 
jerrymathers.com. No, uh, I'm sorry, merch. <laughs> There's a comma and merch. Um, we do things like that. So, cool. so do you, uh, I thought there was like a board game. I remember some of this stuff, seeing, seeing things like that. All sorts of stuff like that. I don't even remember. There were board games. There were puzzles. There were just all sorts of things because different, um, I, you know, companies would come in and say, what can we do from Leave it to Beaver? And then they would make whatever it was. So, you know, and it, it wasn't anything that uh, for the most part we even saw. They would come in, producers would make a deal. And the next thing, we were taking, you know, photos, publicity photos with a board game or a book. There are several books by uh, Beverly Cleary, who was right. a, a very, a very good uh, writer. And so she did some, which are kind of like Leave it to Beaver episodes, but they aren't because there are things that she wrote about Leave it to Beaver. And I, I had heard, is this true that it that a lot of the stories in Leave it to Beaver were actually based on true experiences from the, the creator of it? Oh, very much so. It was actually Joe Conley and Bob Mosier. And between them, they had 15 kids. So they had a lot of people to draw on besides Tony and myself. And of course, I had brothers and sisters. Tony only had one brother. But uh, so they would listen to things and my parents would come in and just say, you know what my kids did this weekend or whatever. And sure enough, you know, three or four weeks later, that might be worked somehow into the show. Wow, that's amazing. That, that, that's, that's, that's incredible. So just so I get this right. So the first six like reruns, I guess, of the show, they pay you. That's great. And then after that, is there any kind of, you know, uh, like all the times, all these, all these syndicated reruns, have you been getting paid on that or not? No, but it, you know, it's not a big thing. It's on a declining scale. Uh -huh. So even the first six, you make well, a good sum of money on the first two or three. And then it starts going down to, you know, it's very, very little and then nothing. But, you know, it was a great show. I'm just glad I get to do personal appearances and people really, it's one of the longest, if not the longest running show in television history. It's been on the air since 1957 and it plays in like 30 languages all over the world. So it's just something that's been a great boon to my life and I make friends all over the world. I love your attitude, Jerry, so much about it. I think that's just absolutely terrific. Um, the the other thing I was curious about, I had heard that they actually removed lines from the show that were too funny, which I would never hear of that now in you know in today's world. Is that is that a true or is that one of those myths? It's it's somewhat true. I mean, if there was something that they thought, you know, they they had put in or that they found that people would laugh at that they didn't really they didn't want it to be a joke show you know there were a lot of shows on at that time where it was set up set up joke set up set up joke leave it to beaver is the world through a child's eye right, right. And it was more of a um in fact it, like all sitcoms it had a laugh track but it really wasn't a comedy it was just a, a, a family show that that it had light moments but it was it was relationships, and it was uh, and, it, and, it, and it had the moral lessons without beating you over the head with it. And Jerry, that was perfect. You, we are watching uh, through the child's eye, as you're the child. They they did a really nice job of allowing you to age and and, and naturally grow up on the show. Um, did you ever have any input on? Hey, I think because of my age now, it should be this, it should be that, or did you just let the writers do their thing? I pretty much honestly just let them do their thing, but I never really found anything that I thought was that offensive. But between the two writers, Joe Conley and Bob Mosier, they had about 14 kids. So they had a lot of things that they could draw on. They knew kids. Um, they knew how they acted. They knew people like Eddie Haskell and Lumpy Rutherford and, uh, you know, Richard and Larry on the show. They all, those were all people that they knew from their kids' friends that they took, and of course made it a lot different for a TV show, but those were all characters that they saw in real life. Did you stay, uh, I, I know that I had read that obviously you and, and uh, Tony Dow were, you know, yet you, there was a big age gap there between the two of you. So I, I heard that, you know, of course, just like brothers would be, it's like you're close, but not as close because you're not exactly the same age. Have you remained friends with, uh, with, um, the cast members, you know, the who are still with us. 
Well, very much so. I mean, but it's probably like people you went to school with. I mean, we don't see each other every day, every week. Um, Tony and I are lucky that, you know, we do personal appearances and autograph shows and we'll be there. And he's a good friend of mine, but I live, you know, in Los Angeles quite a ways from him. Um, yeah. And we both have a separate lives. So it's not like he's not my friend or I have, you know, any anything with him or against him. But it's just fun that I have a nice person that I grew up with all the people on the show. One of the things they tried to do is like even all the people on the set, like the cameramen and the lighting people, they always wanted family people so that they knew how to take care of kids and how to talk to kids. So we just had a very family friendly script. Were, were you close, you know, I mean, obviously you guys all portrayed like the perfect family. I mean, I felt like you were living next door to me, you know, that, it was always that feeling. Um, were you close like that once the cameras, you know, you were, you know, offset? No, it, it was probably more like you would have a relationship with a teacher at school. Hugh Beaumont was very interesting because in reality, what he was was a Methodist minister. And he had a, a congregation in the worst part of L.A. where he basically was dealing with people with uh, uh, substance and alcohol abuse. Wow. And so on, on weekends, that's what he did. He was down there as a minister. And when he started, he was doing a, before Leave it to Beaver, Michael Shane. Now, Michael Shane is this really tough detective that when he wants information, takes people and kind of pounds them against the wall. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I thought. That, that a preacher would really want to be known for. So I think when he <laughs> got into Leave it to Beaver, when he was having those talks with me when I had done, oh, maybe something that I wasn't supposed to, that that's where that came from. I think the preacher, and he, he, was, he wasn't as active as he was um, when the show was over and before, but he was still a fully ordained minister and did some um, you know, uh, work at, with the church the whole time we were on the show. Did he continue uh, throughout his life to, to you know, give back like that? Preach the gospel, yes, he did. Okay, great. The other thing I, I had I read, I loved reading up on all this stuff because I wondered about all of this as I was growing up. Is oh, great. You probably know more than I do. <laughs> oh, come on. He does. He does. But um, Barbara Billingsley, I understood that she would wear, literally, because she always looked perfect, always looked great, but she would wear high heels. And I understand that she actually was getting like higher high heels as you grew or as Tony grew so that you wouldn't, in essence, surpass her. Is that, do you recall that? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't really, I knew that was happening. Oh. Uh, it, what, it, it, well, the, but the reason was not so much that we were getting bigger, it was for the camera. Because when they shot either two shots or things like that, um, it was easier to shoot it if we were about the same size so they didn't have to pull back so far and have such a wide uh, a field on the, on the camera. So a lot of times I at first would be on Apple boxes to be bigger. And then later she would, you know, have high heels or whatever. Interesting. I, you know, I kind of use the show, uh, the podcast, whatever, um, to kind of almost like validate some things. And one of the things that, that I, I had read, gosh, I remember reading this literally probably like 20 years ago, is that when you showed up, you showed up like you, you came multiple times to audition and that you showed up one, one of them as a Cub Scout, you know, you were literally going to your Cub Scout meeting. And you're like, hey, uh, can we get out of here? I, I, I'm going to be late for my meeting. Is that true? Absolutely. It was, a, it wasn't the first one, but we, they, they thought, or they told us the, um, later on that they had about 600 people on the interview. Now, wow. when I say that, you'll say, how could there be 600 beavers? Well, yeah. no, the interview was for beaver, Wally, Eddie, all his friends, oh. all my friends. So they were, and, and that's what was so for us kind of confusing about it because They'd say, okay, now you can go home. You can go home. We'd like you three boys and you four boys or whatever to come back next week. And we were all so different. We were thinking, how are they picking us if the, they, they can't pick, you know, like, like one of the people was Larry Mondello. And uh, he's oh, the God. big guy. So I was thinking, thinking, how can I play that part and he play my part, you know, whatever. So, but when we got on the set and we found out who the characters were, they fit them just perfectly. And were you close with Larry? 
No, we're, we're all good friends. They didn't work every week like I did, um, you know, and there were people, probably the people that people think I'd be the least with would be Eddie Haskell. He was just a wonderful Ken Osman, the actor yeah, that played him. What, he was a decorated Los Angeles police officer, a motorcycle cop that just did, as soon as he got off Leave to Beaver, um, just did acting, you know, kind of to support himself because what he wanted to do, he was a policeman. He was a very decorated and shot in the line of duty police officer. No, wow. he, also, he was also very active in trying to get uh, past, like I think foreign residuals for you guys. And I met him a few times when I was on the board at SAG-AFTRA. And you know, you, 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 you think of people the way their, their characters are. He, he could not have been more opposite. He was kind of humble and shy and sweet. And you know he was so heartfelt. Look, he goes, look, I'm just trying to get what's fair. I'm not trying to do anything. And I was, I just like, Eddie Haskell's a nice guy, but he's not right. Eddie Haskell. I do he have is a question. It, it is until you're speeding down the highway and he pulls you, you over. <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have a question. Is there a, a story or a significance or why the name Bieber? No okay. one uh, that I know has ever been able to tell me. Um, when I first went in for the original interview. That was the character's name. But at that time, it was called Wally and the Beaver. But oh, the first, the first right. um, main sponsors was Remington Rand. And for some reason, they said that sounded like an animal show. And <laughs> <laughs> they, wanted to, they wanted our show. And they, they picked the name Leave it to Beaver. And since they were the, the principal sponsor, right. the writer went, well, OK, if that's the name you want. So uh, right after. We did the pilot, it was a Wally and the Beaver, and then the pilot was even changed to Leave it to Beaver, and it went on from there. How, how did, well, one of the things I had heard about the name Beave was one of the writers, and it might have been Joe, I, I, I'm not sure, but he had been in the war. One of the guys had been in the war, and somebody in his platoon had that, you know, that uh, slang or whatever, that nickname. And that it might have been drawn from there, but I, I think that's one of those that we may never know the answer. If you don't know the answer, I don't know who's going to know the answer on that one. You know, I, I'd been an actor for a very long time, and I just knew that you walked in. And they said, "This is your name for today," and that was yeah. the one you did. Oh, or this, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, or this definitely. Movie or this TV show. So when they said, "Oh, you're the Beaver," okay, that's fine. It didn't bother me a bit. Did now, you? I, oh, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was a, I was a tour guide at Universal when you guys were shooting uh, the new Leave It to Beaver, and then I was the announcer on, at Disney Channel when I would promote the show. But I remember one episode when I was at at, at Jaws Lake, on a and and they were shooting a marathon, and Tony kept running all, all up and down this this one over and over again, getting shots. I used to spend my days off roaming that lot because I just thought it was the most fun. Just you're in you're in a western town, then you're in oh, New yeah. York. Did you did you explore that lot on on well, lunch hour? I I explored it a lot more than just lunch hour because we had two days of rehearsals when I really didn't have a whole lot to do. I knew we'd run the scenes, but there were a lot of scenes that I weren't in or wasn't in. So I would go out and you know I'd go to the Phantom of the Opera stage, oh, back they, to the back no. lots. I used to go fishing on the lakes which yeah. they really weren't all that happy about because they put um, fish in there for um, a mosquito abatement. And here I was pulling them out, but I wouldn't <laughs> put them back. It wasn't like it was, it was catch and release. Um, one of the uh, makeup guys was named Bob Don. And we, he, was, he did all of the things like for Psycho and all the a mask, but when we first started doing Leave it to Beaver, they had one where I had my hair cut, I cut it myself, I lost all my money for the barber shop. And so they got this guy that was this great uh, war, uh, makeup man. And see, our show was a show everybody wanted to work on. So the top people on the Universal lot, because the kids can only work eight to five or nine to six. Oh, yeah. They do a few shots with the kids and they go home. The other series, you might be there till 12 o'clock at night. So we could get the top people and they just love to be on our show. Now on the lot, and that, you know, an, another thing that I, I read about is that you were in a movie called The Trouble with Harry. Is that, is that correct? And I, that with Alfred Hitchcock. I spent uh, about eight weeks in Stowe, Vermont with Alfred Hitchcock. And I used to see him when he was doing the Alfred Hitchcock Presents because he would come on and even 
they, they call it stealing, but it's not really stealing. He'd steal sets when he did his intros and his extros. And it was really, I didn't realize at the time, but it was funny because he was the first person that ever called me Mr. Wow. And he'd say, oh, hello, Mr. Mathers. And, he, and I'd say, oh, I, you, you can call me Jerry. He says, no, you're an actor. If you were an actor and you work for me, you are a mister. So he was the first person to ever call me Mr. Mathers. And I was quite, uh, quite happy about that. What was it like working with him, by the way? Like, you know, as an actor? I had a great time. I mean, I used to, people say, you know, I know a lot of people say he had trouble with other actors. I, I would read my lines while sitting on his lap. He would read the script and he'd say, well, Jerry, let's change this just a little bit. I want you to do it this way or that way. And it was just a really nice time. Of course, we, you know, it was different than doing like even Leave it to Beaver where we were on a stage. We went back to Stowe, Vermont for like, I think it was eight or 10 weeks. So we were a movie company back there. All these ladies in Vermont would do our uh, catering. So every woman would sit there. He was a gourmet. So the women would look and see which one he'd go up and down the aisle. Of course, being little, I'd run right behind him. I'd say, oh, Mr. Hitchcock, what are we going to eat today? He'd go, oh, Jerry, this one looks good. Would you like to take a bite? I'd say, oh, yeah. And we'd take a bite. And we'd have, oh, blueberry muffins. Pick that or the day before right off the, the bush and all sorts of really great food. And all these women oh. were just saying, oh, he took mine today. Mine's the best today because he took mine. <laughs> that is hysterical. You just, you don't think a Hitchcock, quite, I, I'm like, I don't picture him I that know. way. I know. Yeah. I love hearing that that warmth. Yeah, it is ironic that Bob's got the the uh, what is it? The mask of of the life mask. Is life mask. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not that. Yeah, yeah, that's a classic. That that'll that'll scare you, Jerry. Anyway, it's down um, at you. <laughs> hey, I do have one. Speaking of scary, um, the, you know, sometimes you wonder if how true this is. But the the episode in the soup where you are actually right. stuck in the soup. It's up on a billboard. Was it scary? No, you know, actually it was kind of fun because for that entire, we shot, we rehearsed for two days and then shot for three. For the two days that they shot uh, on that show when I was up in the soup bowl, I didn't have to go to school because by the time they got me up there, it was so long to, they had to have a guy, a special stunt man with a, a big harness that put me up there and they'd take me up there and put me up there. And so I didn't go to school for two days. I thought that was wonderful. Of course, the next week I had to go to school for an extra hour each day until I made up those three days that we shot outside. Wow. And it was that, um, I heard that was the most expensive episode. Is that true? It was because they had to build a billboard. I mean, you know, they got this great script. They wrote it. They said, oh yeah, we're going to make this one. They went to the back lot. There are no, you know, there's a lot of sets back there and houses and all. There's Colonial Street. There's bars and all, every, there's a jail back there for all the Westerns. There were <laughs> nothing wow. like that. So they yeah. just said, uh-oh, we got to build one. That's and did they, did they leave that back lot for a while? Sorry? Did they leave that on the back lot for a while? It was there for quite a while. Not a while. I don't, it was there while we were doing the show in case and it never came up. They wanted to make another one where, you know, I was thinking about it or I don't know what, but right. it was there for a long time. So have you, have you seen have you seen that back lot? Because they moved Colonial Street. It, it, it's 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 now where Amblin or it used to be where Amblin is now, and they moved it up above Jaws Lake, and it looks it's a fraction of what it used to be. The lawns are smaller. The street is isn't as vast. Have you seen what it looks like now? Yeah, I've been up there, but I usually don't go on to the to the back lot because I'm usually in there going into the you know the main buildings to talk to producers or directors or things like that so it's not that I wander around the back lot as a child though I mean I was out there all the time at lunchtime I'd run out and fish in the lakes and as I say we'd play baseball back there and football and so it was like you know the the biggest uh, schoolyard in the world that uh, sure. you know with your own lake with your own fishing pond what right. other what other child actors were around at that time that you you know might have befriended or, or or played with on a lot? There weren't a whole lot of other. I mean, there was Tony Dow, Ken Osmond, the people on our show, but there weren't really a lot of other actors on. You know, they were doing Bachelor Father. I think um, she was she was a young lady though, so it wasn't like you know uh, I, I I knew her very well, but. Uh, it wasn't that we would go out and, and do things together. 
the nice part was all the all the people on the show they hired people like lighting directors cameramen they all were family people so they all were used to kids they didn't want people that you know would be not you know and we used to play football and baseball between scenes and throw things and just have a great time what was it weird for you or, or was it kind of exciting for you as a kid to actually see your face in a comic book um because there was the leave it to beaver comics or leave it to beaver everything you know but yeah. the thing was that it wasn't that because i didn't realize that it just was something that everybody didn't do i mean i realized it yeah but i didn't realize how really special it was because somebody came by and said we're going to do a comic book and here it is take a look at it I looked, oh, yeah, this kind of looks like me or you know and we do other things and it was just a really nice time living on the set. I mean, I spent basically eight to five or nine to six for 39 weeks a year. And then we'd go out and do PR, take a, a, about a, a, a six or eight weeks off and then go back to shooting it again for six years. So, I mean, I was a private teacher, a, a, a public school teacher that was really good. Tony had one too, a, a different one because he was in high school. But, yeah. you know, it was just a fun time. Wow. Wow. Did, um, you know, by the way, the other one that I'm curious about, were you really little Ricky on I Love Lucy at one point? Never. No. Never. Okay. No, I don't know how that started, but, you yeah, know, he what does. What is that about? Either I look a little like him or he looks a little like me, but I was never on I Love Lucy and I was never, uh, you know, it was done at a different studio even. I mean, it wasn't even on the same lot. So I don't know how that, but maybe... You know, people see something, they say, well, that kind of looks like it. Maybe it's when he was younger. I was when I was younger, I did do other things. I did a Hitchcock movie, The, the Trouble with Harry. Right. I did two movies with Bob Hope. So I did a lot of things where people probably should have known what I looked like before Leave it to Beaver. Because I started working on live TV when I was two years old. Yeah, somebody claimed it was a, like a flashback moment in the third season. And that one really threw me off because I was like, I don't. I don't recall anything about that. Like looking back at, you know, over, I love Lucy. So I'm glad that you, you kind of validated that, you know, it, no, it but, 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 but he did die in Vietnam. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was that one too. Exactly. Oh, of course that. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I remember that he's not even here right now. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> hey, is it true that your mom came to the set uh, either every day or, or often was there for you? She was there almost every day, except that I have uh, a sister and, and three brothers, and she had a couple of those brothers when I was doing the show. So the wow. last maybe two months, or I don't even know, at the, at the time it seemed like a lot, but when she was pregnant, she would have somebody take me and it would be one of her good friends would take me to the studio and act as my guardian. But you know, it, I basically had a crew of probably 80 men and script women and people like that and a and a teacher to take care of me so it wasn't like it was a big deal but yeah she came most of the time um while, when she could what I part of la did you grow up Arizona. oh yeah me too where about i mean where did you, were you were you like uh portola junior high did you go to uh i went to uh, universal universal studio school of course you did there you go there you go <laughs> that makes sense that makes total sense Hey, um, Hugh Beaumont, you know, obviously, you know, the father on the show, a couple of questions I have for you on that. One, okay. why was he cast after the pilot? Why did they replace the, the original father uh, off the pilot? And second, did he then go on and direct and write episodes? I'll answer them in, a, in reverse order. Yes, he did go on and write episodes because he knew all the characters so well and he had a lot of ideas and his shows were very good. And he even directed a few of the episodes that he actually wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and then he found out how tough that is because sometimes he would write things and then realize, boy, that's really hard to shoot that scene because of the way he'd written it. But yeah. he was just a really nice man. What, um, what was, uh, I also heard this, uh, another validate moment or whatever, get some validation. I heard that Tony Dow didn't actually come to audition for the show. He was just coming with a friend that was auditioning and was then, you know, asked to audition. Do, do you know if there's any truth to that? No, I really don't because he was on a different audition than I was. First, they, inter they auditioned on different days for the okay. part of uh, Beaver and Wally. Um, I know why they picked him, though. He didn't do the original pilot. 
the boy that did the original pilot, it took about probably six or eight months to sell the show where they saw they showed it to different people and Remington ran the typewriter makers and, and Perina were our first two sponsors. They picked it up. But between that time, that boy grew to be over almost six feet. Oh my gosh. Wow. He, he was as big as Ward. So yeah. then they went out. And Tony Dow had only done one show before Leave it to Beaver mm -hmm. because what he was was an AAU swimming and diving champion. And he had done a thing called Johnny Wildlife, which was kind of like a Tarzan movie. And that was the only other acting experience. And his, pa his parents thought he, he was training for the Olympics, actually, when he came in for the interview for Leave it to Beaver. And that's what they thought he was going to be was a uh, an Olympic swimmer and diver. And so it was a little, um, you know, touchy at times because we'd go someplace like to a swimming party or something and Tony would go up and get on the diving board, do three flips and, you know, land in the water. <laughs> I'd be over in the shallow and going, oh yeah, I can swim. I think I can make it to the other side. <laughs> wow. When I was a kid, because they because reruns were back to back, you know, the local TV right. station, I was very confused that Larry's mother was also Aunt Harriet on Batman. And, they, <laughs> and she looked, looked the same, played the characters the same. She was too old to be his mother, I thought, on, on, on Leave it to Beaver. But I was just, I just blew. And why is she on, on, in color on this one? But I'm little. I'm a little kid. It's, it's just not, not making sense to me. Well, you know, Larry would age anybody. Right? There you go. There you there go. You go. I, Perfect. I, I have a question. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Okay. Uh, reunion movie. I'm uh, sorry, what? The reunion movie. The uh, reunion, uh, yes. Bill the Beaver. How did that come about? How long was it in the works? And did anybody say no, or do anyone have to be talked into doing it? Well, we all had to be talked into doing it, but it wasn't a hard talk. They just said we're so. going to do it. And the, the problem was we were all doing um, different things. I was a, a real estate agent at the time. I was a multi-million dollar real estate agent. So I had, you know, a wow. job that I was going to. I had houses that were in escrow and they said, why don't you come back and do Leave it to Beaver? I went, well, you know, I've got basically a, a full-time job. Uh, Tony was also doing things and, uh, uh, you know, so it was something that I wanted to do. And I said, well, that'll be fun. We'll just do, a, you know, a, just one episode is what we thought we were going to do. And it was going to be on and be how we were grown up. And I said, that'll yeah. be fine. Well, it was so popular that right away they said, well, we're going to do a series. And I said, well, yeah, but I've got other things. They said, well, no, we're doing a series. I said, okay. So that's how we got, that's how the show came. And everybody had the same, the same thing. You know, uh, Tony was doing other things. I don't exactly know even what he was doing, but we all had gone from the show and it had been like a number of years. So uh, even though we still worked as actors, when you do a series, you're doing 39 a year. So it's a big commitment. Oh, yeah. How did it how did it feel seeing those sets again? Because they did a darn good job of recreating that house. The well, interior. They, have all, they have all the blueprints. That's what they did. So they went back oh. and, you know, they have the blueprints for everything from, you know, Gone with the Wind over at Universal or whatever. They have, and they just went to Leave it to Beaver. Oh, yeah, here's the house. And it's the same house. I mean, it's the exact same house. It's like with building blocks. They knew exactly where every, <laughs> every room was, what colors they were. Uh, all those kind of things. And it was just a really a lot of fun. In fact, we even used on the back lot, the same house. Right. Well, I will tell That's you amazing. that when, I, when I, my first year as a tour guide, we had Ward Cleaver's tombstone in our break room. Oh, which wow. Is, it's much creepy, but it was just, I don't, I, and I was like, how did you guys get this? They just went to the prop department and, and just, just put it in, in, in the break room. But wasn't he still around when you guys did that movie? No, he had, he had already passed. Barbara Billingsley was really nice too. She was a, a really high-end New York fashion model. Oh, no um, kidding. Yeah, so she was she was just absolutely beautiful. Tony Dow was an AAU swimmer and diver, right. uh, a champion with all these medals and everything. And uh, they were just, everybody on the show was just so nice. We all got along very well. Never had. Uh, Probably, do I want to go home with somebody? <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. We, we get I, into that. Jeez. There we go. There okay. we go. 
No, hey, Jerry, the, hey, Jerry, this is a clean show. Can we keep this clean, please? That's very clean. I think, you oh, know, what's wrong with home. that? He, he didn't go home with her. He was just asked. Yes. So I wanted to ask, uh, like, tell a couple of things. First of all, um, you left the show, I understand, because you were like, I want to go to high school. I want to I want to go on for, for to my schooling. Is that true? And then um, what? Why? Well, let me let me just answer that one while you think of the next one. OK, oh, yeah. The, the answer is it is yes, but that wasn't the reason the show. They had us under contract for only six years because of the I think it was the union laws of how long you could put a person under contract for. Oh, wow. and so it wasn't that um, what most people did, or if you on a really popular series, they would ask for huge raises. And so we weren't really doing that, but it was the perfect time because Tony was ready to go to college and I was ready to go to high school. I'd never been in school with any other kids. I had a private tutor um, before leaving to Beaver. Um, and then when Beaver started, so I had never um, because I was doing movies is why I had the private tutor. I never had been in, kid, in a classroom with other kids. So I always wanted to go to high school. So um, I played on the football team. I couldn't play sports. I played on the football team and had a lot of good friends. And so it was kind of a socialization thing for me. And it was just, it ended at the right time. It was my freshman year. What, what position did you play on the football team? Do you remember? Center. What was it? Center. Center. You played center? Oh wow. Okay. That's a that's a that's a tough position to say the least. I had to keep all those big guys in line. I guess. I guess. That's interesting because when you say that about the six-year contract, because I think that was that uh, Olivia de Havilland law or or whatever that went through about the contracts that you could only keep someone under, under contract for that limited, you know, period. And then it's right. well, well you, you could you could always re-up their contract. But if you were on a really popular show, people would say, okay, I want you know three or four times the money because once you signed it, it was a six year contract. So for the four, for the whole six years, you were, you know, you got a bump, a, a raise every season. We did 39 shows uh, a year. Right. And you get a little bump, but you know, then the people would say, this is a very popular show and I want, you know, a lot more money to do it. Would you, um, when you left, I, I understand that you said you did go into, uh, was it commercial loans or was that uh, a real estate? Did you, did you want to stay with that or had you wanted to go back to acting? Well, I went, I went actually back to high school. So I went to high school, right. I went to college, and then I just happened to have an opportunity to have a, a very good friend that, um, of mine that when I came back was the... Um, a, a very high executive in, in, a, in a, uh, one of the, I think it was the fourth or fifth leading bank in the United States. And he said, well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to go back to acting? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, you know, you've got, and I honestly did, I'm not trying to brag, but I had a lot of money and I had been investing it. And wow. he said, I've been watching you invest all this money. And I think you're doing a very good job. Why don't you come to the, the bank and, you know, you can come in as a, a loan officer. We'll teach you about money. And, and I thought, Chad, that's a great idea. So I was at a bank for about, um, I think it was three or four years. I became a commercial loan officer. And I suddenly realized that the people that were making all the money were the people selling real estate at that time because there was a huge boom in California. So mm -hmm. then I went into real estate and did that. And it worked out very well because then I got the, uh, the opportunity to do the new Leave it to Beaver, which I did right. for another six years. And I had a family then and I played the ward part and we had a, a, a boy that played Wally and the Beaver. They, they were different, but it was an updated version of the show. So everything just worked out really well for me. Are you still acting now? I still do, but not, not as often. Um, you know, when people call me, I go and I do it and it's fun, but a lot of times they, they want me to do like cameos of Leave it to Beaver. Well, I'm not, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 years old anymore. So you, it's, you it's still a, are to me. <laughs> I, that's, see, that's the problem. <laughs> but I don't, I don't mind it. And to be honest with you, I, um, because I worked in the bank, I became very um, aware of how money is and how to handle money. So it's the kind of thing that I don't really have to be a full-time working actor 
to be able to support a very nice lifestyle. That's, but Jerry, you, yeah. you also have such a great attitude, and so does everybody. Uh, we, we, uh, John and I, you know, we talk about classic television, and this is our our thing. We, we just love it. But so many former actors or for our, our sitcom actors, there's a bitterness that 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 they don't understand that when people say, "What was it like?" Blah blah blah. What was it like? Was stuff. It's because they care. The audience really cares. Right. And you have always had such an affection for this legacy that you have left that will be around forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Oh, it's just something for me that it, it's really nice to be able to go into almost any place in the United States and in reality all over the world because Leave it to Beaver plays in like 40 different languages. So in Japan, I speak with Japanese, but I speak in a very high girl's voice. Uh, <laughs> and so there, it's all over the world. I get people that come up to me and they're not really, they just don't understand because they're from a different country. If they're over here on vacation, they come up to me and they start chattering in the native language and they're used to seeing me speak their language and they don't understand it. Oh yeah, it's dubbed. Well, well I, I, will, I, 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 I thought you knew all those languages. Exactly, right? It kind of takes I me wish back. I did. Oh, yeah. I wish I did. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's just... A, it's just been a, a boon to me my whole life. I've met people and done a lot of things. You know, I appreciate my fans and they're great. And, you know, they're, they're always telling me, this is my favorite episode. And a lot of times it's the same one, but a lot of people say, because that really happened to me. So it's a different episode. Right. You know, it, it's just been wow. a boon to me my whole life. Well, I will tell you that one of my most enjoyable moments was uh, when you were serving on the PGEC. And I had, we had a gathering. You with better the, explain to people what that is. But I know you think oh, everybody knows. Thank you, know, Jerry. Right? Thank you. Yes, Bob, <laughs> if you could come off your altar there. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's uh, the uh, Performers Peer Group Executive Committee at the Television Academy. It is the, there's- Yeah, that just rolls out on his tongue. <laughs> right. If you could say that five times fast, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks. It's a bunch of people <laughs> at the Television Academy and they're doing things and watching people. And it, it, basically it's a committee that oversees the performers, uh, the performing members of the Television Academy. But when, when Lily Tomlin uh, won her election, uh, I had a little gathering at my house and Lily and the, our whole committee, which we had a superb committee. And of course, Jerry, and I, all I kept thinking was if I could go back in time to younger Bob and say, someday you're gonna have a party with Lily Tomlin and Beaver Cleaver. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have believed. <laughs> Your so, worst nightmare. <laughs> no, because, because these two flavors don't, it's like, it's like you, you put your chocolate on my peanut butter. These two flavors don't necessarily go together, but it was so, it was Twilight Zone surreal. And again, also she is one of the sweetest, That's kindest lady. Of fun. I, I really enjoyed my time there. Well, and this guy, John Cato, got me into the TV Academy back in the 90s. Okay, when, a long when, time said, ago. At a, at a voiceover audition. But it's you your know. fault, right? <laughs> it is, it is. He said, they owe him a lot though. He's done a hell of a job. Well, he said, you qualify to join the TV Academy. I'm like, I don't have an Emmy. I, what are you talking about? I had no idea that you could, you could, by being a working actor, you could join. Yeah, it was a big, it was definitely a hey, big thing. Leave it to Beaver ever, did any, 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 any nominations, any wins? I don't, I don't, we never got a win. We were nominated a few times. Um, it, I don't think it was the cast as much as the writers and then mm -hmm. maybe like it, the camera people and stuff like that. I remember going to uh, probably three or four under the six year run um, when we had people in our either cast or crew people that were nominated for something and we went there to support them because they'd get a table and it was, you know, a lot of fun and you'd see right. a lot of actors that uh, you never saw because people think all actors know each other. No, we were of all course. at different studios. So oh, you know, I'd say, oh, look, there's so-and-so from that. I know that person. Yeah, well, Jerry, everybody knows you like that because you're on a show, but I know that person. <laughs> right, right, oh, yeah, right. Right, exactly. You, yeah, because you're in your own little bubble. Yeah, sure. That's right. We were at Universal and, you know, that was it. You were there basically five days a week uh, nine to six or eight to five for the kids and of course the adults work longer but uh you know it was it was a very regimented schedule when i was working as an actor on leave it to beaver wow well jerry i i you know i really appreciate you giving us your time i i i can't tell you how much fun uh i i know both of us just had just i i'm with bob i mean so fun guys he's, he's a 
You got to watch him. He's a really funny guy all the time. Yeah, yeah. he thinks so. Anyway. Um, I think so, too. So now it's two <laughs> against one. <laughs> Great. Now I'm in a fight with the beef. I love it. There you go. Uh, right? But uh, Here, in her diary. It's, I had to fight with the beef. I fought the beef. Um, but anyway, Jerry, seriously. Though, the beef won. The beef, <laughs> the beef won being on the show. Believe me, that, that was it right there. You won from the start. Um, well, it's but, my pleasure. My pleasure being on your show. Thank you're you. You're the best, buddy. You really are. Thank you so much, Jerry. And we wish Teresa, you the best. Good to see you too. What was that? I said, Teresa, good to see you too. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Good to see you. I, great to see you, Teresa. And, and right. guess what? I must have done good because you didn't kick me once. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on it. Bob, we will talk to you soon as well. That was great, guys. Bye -bye. See you, Jerry. Take care, Bye -bye. Jerry. Stay tuned. Coming later this month, if you are a cartoon fan, do not miss this podcast. I will interview none other than Bob Bergen, the voice of Porky Pig, and of course my co-host, as we take a look at the history of Looney Tunes. Follow us on Spotify and iTunes and leave us a review. Thank you so much.